In my previous video, I explored a bit of my factor field graph shown here again, but as it was already approaching 20 minutes in length, I had to cut out a lot of what I wanted to talk about. But this is YouTube. You can always make another video. And what I wanted to talk about is two facts about prime numbers and how they relate to infinity, which when we view those two facts together, seem somewhat contradictory. So what's the first infinite fact about primes? Well, there are an infinite number of primes. And to demonstrate that, I'm just going to basically use the same argument that Euclid did clear back 300 years before Christ. The proof is a standard proof by contradiction, meaning that we will assume the opposite of what we want to prove. And when we show that's impossible, it means that what we really want to prove must be true. We want to prove that there are an infinite number of primes, so let's assume there are only a finite number of primes, and when that is proven wrong, we'll know there must be an infinite number. So if there are a finite number of primes, then we can list all the primes. It might be a massive list, but it is not infinite, so it can be done, at least in theory. So let's suppose we have a list of all the prime numbers, and we multiply each of them together. Let's just say n equals prime 1 times prime 2 times prime 3 times prime 4, all the way up to the last prime number that exists, which we'll call prime n. So far, n itself, which is just the multiple of all the primes, it's just a big number, and it's not that interesting. But what if we were to consider n plus 1? What are the factors of n plus 1 in particular? We know that 1 is a factor since 1 is a factor of all numbers. But 2 cannot be a factor of n plus 1, since 2 is one of the primes that we multiply together to give us the result of n. So if n is divisible by 2, n plus 1 cannot be divisible by 2. The next number after n that is divisible by 2 is n plus 2, not n plus 1. The same thing is true of 5 and 7 uh, and all the other primes. Since n is divisible by 5, n plus 1 cannot be divisible by 5. So that means we have a problem. No prime numbers can be factored out of n plus 1. This means either n plus 1 is itself prime, in which case we've discovered a prime that exists outside of our list of all the primes that exist, or n plus 1 is not prime. If it's not prime, however, it must be divisible by some other prime number. That's the definition. Numbers that are not prime are divisible by other prime numbers. If n plus 1 is divisible by some other prime number, that other prime number also cannot exist on our list of all the prime numbers that exist. Either way, our assumption that there are a finite number of prime numbers is proven false because we have to have a prime number that does not exist on that list. So that's the first fact about prime numbers. But that brings me now to our second fact, the one that I said is somewhat contradictory. In my previous video, I talked about these six spikes, specifically this one at 2520. These are reflection points in our factor field, where as we're coming down these loops of here every two, here every three, every four, they meet up on this line. And one of the factors that makes these spikes really stand out is the fact that we have these arms that go up and these arms that go down, and they are the same length of the spike that we've got here. So this spike is 10 columns wide. So this arm that goes up will go up to 2510. That's 10 less than 2520. And it will go down to 2530, which is 10 more than 2520. So however long this spike is, these arms will be just as long. And again, it makes perfect sense because this is just a loop. Every single one of these values loops at exactly what their column is. Every two is on the second column. Every three is on the third. It is an inherent geometrical necessity of this graph. This will happen. But remember, these are representing factors in numbers. So what does that mean? It means that since we have this huge spike at 2520, 2518 can't be prime. Now that's obvious. 2518 is even. But you can see it here, it's being blocked by this arm. 2517 can't be prime because it's one of the, it's divisible by three. Uh, 2516 is divisible by four, etc. This arm is blocking all of these numbers between 2510 and 2520, except possibly 2519 from being prime. And we can see actually 2519 is blocked by this one on the 11th column. But 2521 is probably prime. Um, let's just arrow over really quick to see if any of these have any factors in here. And it looks like it doesn't. Now, again, there are some limitations on this. This only goes out to 256 
columns wet white but that's more than sufficient for us to know that the there is no factors further up because if there was a factor further to the right there must be a corresponding factor closer to the left hand side so we know for example 2518 is divisible by 2 because of this cell right here but if 2518 is divisible by 2 it means that another factor of 2518 would be 2518 divided by 2 which is 1259 so if we scrolled out to uh, 1,259 columns, we would see another factor. So, so with all that in mind, remember that I had mentioned in the previous video that we can make these as long as we want them to, to be. I proposed making one of them a million factorial in length. What that would mean is not just that we would have this long row of a million columns out there, but the corresponding arms going up and arms going down would block any of those values from being prime as well for a million rows the only ones that would not necessarily be blocked are going to be the one immediately before and immediately after that long spike and as you can see here it's not a guarantee that they will be prime because this one's not prime 2519 is not a prime number in other words while euclid envisioned multiplying just the prime numbers together what if we multiplied all the numbers together Say we took the 1 million factorial again as our n value. We know that n is going to be a massively huge number, of course. But we also know that other than 1 million factorial plus or minus 1, there will be 999,999 rows before n and 999,999 rows after n where it is impossible for there to be a prime number. In mathematics, it is certainly possible for us to take n factorial and think of the limit as n approaches infinity. And what that leaves us with is a stretch of numbers that cannot be prime that itself is infinite in length at the limit. In other words, while there are an infinite number of prime numbers, if you push n factorial to the limit, you will have an infinite drought twice over since it's on both sides of that total value of n where it is impossible for primes to exist other than possibly the two prime numbers immediately next to that reflecting point. And what I find most amazing is that these arms travel both up and down the factor field, meaning that it's just the way the loops are that it forms this infinite block before we even get to the reflection point that goes the other way. And consider what it means to have an infinitely long arm coming back down from infinity towards zero. It's almost like our naive assumptions of infinity would make it impossible for there to be any prime numbers at all, since these infinitely long arms would block it in both directions, at the limit where n is infinity. Of course, it's because of things like that that we must insist that infinity cannot be viewed as if it has a numerical value. Infinity is not a number, and it doesn't make sense for us to say infinity factorial has any real value either. In fact, if you want a more precise way of describing what I'm talking about here, it would be to say that we can make arbitrarily long stretches of non-prime numbers. But regardless of the precision in mathematics of what I'm saying, I do have to say thinking about infinity in this way is, to me, a lot of fun. What does it mean to have this infinite long arm coming back from infinity towards zero? It's one of those things you can't really wrap your mind around because inherently it's... it's um, these are patterns, and we're pushing these patterns, which are models, onto numbers which are abstract. And the abstraction of our models might not actually be exactly correct. It might not tell us truth from what an, uh, the abstract numerical values are, just because we can have a graphical representation that says one way or another. So I like to view this not just as uh, something that's fun to play with, but something that gives us insight into reality and lets us think more about what does it mean to have objective truth? What does it mean to have uh, coherence between a model and reality? How much of reality truly is modeled on mathematics and how much is just a happy coincidence? These are all really deep questions that's always fun to think about. And with that, I'm going to let you think about it for now. You guys have a wonderful day.